most benefit and the uh, stage now for uh, Brooke Baron to present the rest of the mixture for So first of all, which, uh, you know, just some uh, housekeeping issues. Which, uh, who, are, who are the junior residents here? Me too. Uh, who, are the, who are the seniors here? <laughs> so, um, you know, when, when uh, one of the things uh, I have to do is, uh, you know, we always talk about thanking, um, you know, the, the hosts for having us here and so on and so forth. Uh, I think those, those, those pre-functory remarks are very, very uh, important and they, they come from the heart. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, we are, first of all, we are not here to teach anything. We are here to learn from each other. Uh, that should be the spirit. So there is no senior, junior. It's like Islam. All are brothers. Right? So we, we have to learn from each other. We are not here to, to hammer in your head. Everyone is an adult. Uh, one of the things uh, Dr. Hassan Wahaba and I, we met for the first time in Los Angeles. Uh, we were all, we were, we were, from third world countries, we were considered, now we call it the developing world, these are all euphemisms, we know exactly what it means. It means you're a third world guy, that's what we were told. Um, we came from post-colonial countries, we went to, this, to, to England, to the States, and so on and so forth. Almost all our, you know, we came from educated families, education was valued, uh, and, and now you're growing up in a, in a time when you don't come in a post-colonial world, you're your own man, you're your own boss, the stupidest question is the one you don't ask. Okay, so there is nobody who's going to criticize you for asking a question. Uh, when 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 I was a resident in Bombay and would ask my teacher something, he would say, "You're a stupid guy. Why don't you go read the book?" If I don't know something, I'm going to tell you I don't know it. It's okay. It's all right to say I don't know it. It's not okay to bluff, to lie. That is not okay. That is cheating. Okay. So. With this particular uh, stuff that we are going to present to you today is not mine. This comes from my friend Ralph Nelson who wrote this manual. You have all seen the, 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 the manual. Uh, we are going to go very quickly through these slides because I want more time and stop me. If there is any question, stop me. It is okay to stop me uh, and, and then we will, uh, we will deal with your questions for sure. All right. So let's talk about the first one of the complexities of mid year anatomy is, is this uh, lecture that, uh, that we normally give. If we have some time, then we will give you something on cross-sectional anatomy of the ear because uh, that is something else that it explains to us uh, what, what things are. There are two or three things that you have to remember before the temporal bone course. Number one, you have to, you are working, I'm, I'm going to use that board if that's okay with you. First thing you've got to do is you've got to, when you're doing microsurgery, if I take my hand, and if I keep my hand in the air like this, versus keeping my hand close by, there is more tremor in my finger if I keep my hand out. That is the reason why we don't use a 400 millimeter lens for a gear surgery. We use a 250, 300 millimeter lens. If you keep your hands out, so you have to learn to rest your hands. Either you have a chair, don't have a chair, use a mayo stand, use something to rest your hands. When you take a picture with the camera, what do you do? You, you, you get in close. It's, it's all got to do with levers. The moment you start getting a, 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 your muscles are working hard, you're going to get a tremor in your hands. And, and it doesn't look very nice on TV either. So there are some people who have tremors in their hands and they can still operate. So just because you've got a tremor, you have a, an unintentional tremor in your hand, during the moment of doing the surgery, it'll be okay. But you've got to concentrate and work on that. Right? That's the first thing. So if, for example, I have a, you have a stick, if I make a small movement over here, it is going to make a very large movement over here. Which is why when you're using the drill, they, they will tell you, use it like a paintbrush. Why should you use it if you're drilling? You have to get the job done. There's no reason to hold it like a paintbrush, you hold it at the end like this, and you're not doing, you're not a Picasso. I mean, you're going to do surgery, you want to do it efficiently, quickly, and there are parts of the surgery which have to go fast. There are parts of the surgery where you have to go slow. Number two, how, how, what kind of a posture are you going to maintain in the, in the office? You don't want to be stretching like this with the microscope. Your back is going to be hurting at the end of a long case. The discovery is not a discovery case, you will be finished. 
uh, lots of, of, of ear surgeons develop bad, bad necks because we, have, we maintain a very bad posture. In the so make yourself comfortable. Number three, if there is extraneous noise in the operating room, nothing is more important than that patient on the table. It's not the music in the room. I like to have music in the room. But there are certain times when I cut the music. I tell the nurse, no more idle chit chat. You have to concentrate. There are certain places where you can do it. There are certain places where you should not do it. That, that is something which each individual person has to decide. Number four, you have to know where the facial line is. There is no, no guesswork here. The reason for that is if, if we don't know where the facial line is, and, that, and, and the mistakes have to be made today in the lab, not on the patient. You, you want to have your whole career without a patient of paralysis. That should be your goal. Okay? I have not done this for a long time. I have had one congenital year where I caused a patient with temperature paralysis. And to this day, when I, when I go at, uh, to sleep at night, I think about this child. Right. Number five, you have to do this case three times. You plan for the case. You have to study the CT scans before this serious business. You, <coughs> you have to treat that patient like you are treating your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your child. Period. This is the basic of medical ethics. You have to know your, I insist that my residents, if they will operate on my patient. They have to know their patient. I will ask them questions in the morning. They don't answer their question, they don't talk. They sit and watch. If they, if they answer, they, they, they have to know their patient. So it's very important to be involved. You have to take ownership of the patient. It's very, very important. That is something you will pick up today. You, you don't pick it up suddenly when you're 45 years old. It happens when you're trained. So with these, these few words, we're going to start very quickly with the, with the, with the anatomy of the, of the ear. Whenever you are looking at the microscope, we will talk about bifocal technique, I think, in the lab. How to adjust the microscope, we will talk in the lab because you need a microscope for that. The other thing is, you always want to saucerize. I mean, uh, uh, Jim Sheehy used to say, you want to saucerize. Why do you want to saucerize? You want to saucerize because you are looking through this microscope. Okay? Now, if you make a narrow channel, if you make a narrow channel like this, and you have got one instrument here, one instrument here, and your microscope is sitting over here, you have a very narrow angle. In fact, your instruments are going to come in the way. However, if you make this a, a saucer, make it wide, now your instruments are coming in at different angles, and you are able to see what you're doing. So you don't want your, your things to come in the way. The more saucerized it is, the more light you're getting in. So the larger the aperture, the more light you're going to get in. The more light you get in, the better you see. Do not compromise. If, if you, as, as a junior surgeon, I remember I once got into the dura because I was lazy to move the microscope. If you can, you if you are operating on on the on the mastoid surface, you want to see what surface. If you are operating on the posterior canal, you should be able to see that posterior canal. If you are operating on the tegmen, you have to see that tegmen. If you undercut, you will get into dura because you don't you won't even know when you have got into. Now, the drills on the, in the lab, I don't know what speed they're running at, but in the operating room, you are generally running at 70, 80,000 RPM. At 70, 80,000 RPM, you have a weapon in your hand. You can do some major damage with this weapon. So you have to know how to use it. You have to respect the facial law, respect your instruments, and then we, we go from there. All right. Let's start off uh, very quickly with... Uh, All right, so what is a basic mastrodectomy? So the basic mastrodectomy is something you should be, do, be able to do very, very easily. Uh, this is a left temporal bone. You can see this is the axillary canal. This is the uh, uh, posterior canal wall. You have the tegmen up here, and you have something called the sinus plate down there. Uh, you have an angle over here called the sinodural angle. Why is it called the sinodural angle? Sinus and dura. So that is therefore sinodural angle. You have the mastoid tip. It's important to get these terms in your head fixed because when, the reason is when we communicate with each other, we should all be talking about the same thing. Okay? So it does not become the durosinal angle, it is always the sine of um, Now, when you are looking at, uh, at, a, at a basic mastrodectomy, this is the same left temporal bone but with the, with the head in the erect position. So when you look at Gray's anatomy, you have everything in, in an erect position. But what do you do when you are when you're on the table? You are laying down, turning the head this way. So what have you done? You have taken everything in Gray's anatomy and you are turning it through 90 degrees. So for me, that was the first important thing to learn is all the, all, everything is now twisted 
through 90 degrees when you're when you're looking at the anatomy. There is an area called McEwen's triangle. It is not Masevin's triangle. It is the, the, the triangle of Sir William McEwen. And Sir William McEwen described a triangle that was bordered by the posterior superior canal wall, or so-called the spine of Henley, the supramastoid crest, and a tangent drawn to the posterior canal wall, like this. It is also sometimes referred to as the Gridrose area. Now, why is that important? That particular area is important in the days when they used to do mastoidectomy with gouge and hammer. When they did a mastoidectomy with a gouge and hammer, they wanted to find where the antrum was. And the, they felt that the McEwen's triangle is a good landmark to get to. So if you drop in a vertical shaft, 1.25 centimeters, you will get into the mastoid antrum, most often. Okay? We don't do that anymore because we've got high speed drills. We saucerize. We saucerize. We find where it is. We don't go in blindly and chisel away at, at something. There was another operation which was described by, uh, for, for endolymphatic sac surgery uh, that was uh, done by George Sportman, where again they would take, make a little tunnel and, and go to the, to, to the posterior fossa and get it. So it is important to know this, this area, um, but just so you know, when it is a surface landmark for the mastered antrum. And what is the mastered antrum? The mastered antrum is the most constant air cell in the mastered air cell system most often the largest air cell in the mastered air cell system. What is the mastered air cell system? Or what is the middle ear cleft? The middle ear cleft runs from the eustachian tube to the last air cell in the tip of the mastoid. So that whole thing is sometimes referred to as the middle ear cleft. All right? Now, when you're going into mastoid surgery, you're always going from known to unknown. That is, that is a basic principle. If you, if you are going to the next step without doing the previous step, step back. There is no hurry. You got a patient under anesthesia. You're not not working under local anesthetic. So and this and the patient today is not going to wake up. Right. So so don't worry about it. Take your time. If if I have to wait here till two o'clock in the morning to help you out, I will wait. Okay. So what we're going to do is so the first you make two cuts. Different people do it different ways. There there are several ways to skin a cat. You can make a you you make a, a cut over here. Mario Sano's group they make it they make a triangle. Doesn't matter. What is important is this portion over here, which is in the area of McEwen's triangle, has to be kept as the deepest portion. Why does that have to be kept the deepest portion? It has to be kept as the deepest portion because you want to hit the antrum first. Why do you want to hit the antrum? Because that's where you're going to start seeing the landmarks. If you open an air cell over here, you're not going to see the landmarks. So what good is it to open other air cells? So you want to do, do it efficiently, so you start sneaking away all this bone very quickly uh, uh, to get in and, and remove the cortical bone. Once you remove the cortical bone, you're going to hit one of two things. Either you're going to see marrow, which sometimes will bleed, sclerotic mastoids, where you'll have no marrow, or, you, or you'll have an, a pneumatized cell. When you're doing cochlear implants, you generally have a pneumatic uh, mastoid. So then you go to, you see that the air cell system, you again got this root of the zygoma over here, you've made the canal wall. Over here, today when you're drilling, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to keep that canal wall exceedingly thin. Sheehy used to say you should be able to see your instrument. If you put an instrument on, on this side of the bone, it should be eggshell thin. I don't think it's that critical. Because when you make it eggshell thin in the patient, sometimes this bone will necrose. Them, and you can get a cholesterol on the EAC. So I don't make it that thin, but in the, in the lab, I think you should try to really shave it down and make it thin because you want to see the anatomy. Uh, uh, but so, so what we have done over here is you, you have gone in deeper and then there is a, a plate of bone that you can sometimes hit which can sometimes be quite dense and that is referred to as corner's septum. Right? What is the corner septum? It is, the, it is a continuation of the temporomastoid suture line. It is, a, it is a developmental plate of bone and once you penetrate through the, through the corner septum, you get into the antrum. So the corner septum will sometimes confuse you. The corner septums will sometimes look exactly like a dense bone of the horizontal semicircular canal. It's not. Right. Are you with me so far? Is everybody <coughs> you're, you're with me or you, am I talking too fast? No, it's, it's okay. It's all right. Okay. So now what, what we have done is we've, we've entered the mastoid, mastoid antrum and, and you're starting to see, you're, you will start to realize as you're dissecting some very subtle changes in the color of the bone. So you start to see something that's looking more sort of like old ivory, yellowish, but very hard bone. And you're starting, you start to see something in the base over there 
that that is that is uh, 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 the uh, uh, horizontal semicircular canal. You also will see that the air cells disappear as you get to the posterior canal wall. The air cells disappear as you get to the sigmoid sinus. So it's vitally important, and sometimes it's better to use a cutting burr rather than a and th than a diamond burr, because the diamond burr also pushes bone dust in front of it, and as that bone dust enters those air cells, it's sometimes hard to tell what's what. So, uh, if you, and, and you, if you're going to use a diamond burr, make sure you have continuous suction irrigation. You will raise, you can boil water with a diamond burr. So, if you if you take, if you don't use, uh, you keep water in the mastery, try it, and push, put some pressure on it. You will make it smoke. The, the, the bone will actually burn. So, be very, very gentle with, with tissue respect is vitally important. As you, so here we've dissected out the sigmoid sinus. You've dissected out an area called the digastric ridge. Now, how does the what is the what is the formation of the digastric ridge? What is on the other side of the digastric ridge? Anybody remember, sir? Huh? Posterior, very good. And what is the nerve supply? So, seven. Yeah, correct. So, posterior belly, then it's got a dual nerve supply. But anyways, you, you should know that that it's the fish will very good. So, so you've got the, the digastric ridge that is. Is basically in Gray's anatomy described as a digastric groove because it's, it's a groove on the other side. So it's a groove on this side, it's a ridge on this side. Okay. So that's essentially what happens. So, so there you have it. You have the, the digastric ridge, you have the sigmoid sinus, and here you're starting to see a very dense bone, which is the bone of the horizontal semicircular canal. Same stuff that you saw over here. You're seeing over here, this is the horizontal semicircular canal. There is an area over here where the, where the posterior canal wall ends. And that is sometimes referred to as the fossa incutis. Why is the fossa incutis important? What is attached over there? There is the posterior ligament of the incus that is attached there. So the short process of the incus is attached to the fossa incutis. It forms a little pivot. It's a joint that, 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 uh, that, that is attached over there. And why is that important? If you drill on, on a bone at 70,000 RPM, and if you touch that incus, and if that incus is attached to the state as you're transmitting vibrations, you'll get, a, you'll get a notch at 4 kilohertz just from the noise of the drill. So you're, it is vitally important. So when you are starting to dissect into the root of the zygoma, one of the things that tell the residents is find the tegmin. What is the what is the harm in finding the tegmin? Find the tegmin and chase it forward. It's better to do that because if you drill on the incus, you're going to get into trouble. You know where the tegmin is. You find you find the plate of the tegmin. You understand tegmin. Tegmin means roof. The actual meaning of, of tegmin is the roof. So if you if you find that roof, trace it forward. And remember that the tegmin, as it goes forward, not only does it go forward, but it tends to come down. It tends to swivel. It, it spirals in. So it's, it's, it's laterally you have more space, but as you go medially, it is coming down to meet you. So, so it's vitally important to get that anatomy in your head and take a temporal bone. Look at your temporal bone from, from outside before you start building. So you will know how that tegmin looks. So that because in the patient, they're not going to be able to do it. Today you can. Now, once you dissect that out, as you go, you have the most space from the incus. The incus is going to be lying over there. Then so you'll have the most space up here, so it will keep you safe. Normally, I, I know in my head exactly what size of drills I'm going to use. When I'm doing the master, and it saves you time. You, the, when I'm doing the cortical master, I know I'm going to use a five or a four, depending on the adult or child. I know that when I start to go over here, I'm going to go to three, two, one. I, I, I know that. I know exactly. What, what I'm going to do, and you'll, you'll come up with your own system. So the nurses also know exactly what drills to have available to you when you need them. The next thing you want to do is you want to keep this bone very, very thin. And then what you have to do is you want to drop this, this floor. You, you take your diamond burr or polishing burr or whatever, and when you start dropping that floor, you don't want to presume that the facial nerve is over here or there or that the facial could be going like this. It could be coming out. It can be going back. You don't know. You have to find it. Now, we described some measurements and stuff. I, I, I won't talk about the measurements. I, don't, I think you should, you should find the nerve yourself. How do you find the nerve? There are, there are cells over here with the, let's do it this way. So, there, if, this is the, the, if this is the facial nerve over here, there are going to be some cells over here. There are going to be cells over here. But whenever there's an important structure, I told you there's going to be compact bone around. So, when you drop it, in, in a live patient, you'll see something that's looking a little pink over there. If you start to see bleeding, be careful. If you start to see bleeding, you're getting very, very close to the, to the sheet of the facial nerve. 
If you start to see bleeding at the tegment, be careful, you're getting close to dura. If you start to see bleeding at the back, be careful, you're, you're, you're getting probably close to the sequoid sinus. So it's very important to remember that if you start to get bleeding from there, be, uh, be very cautious. Do not depend on your facial nomonitor. Facial nomonitor gives you confirmation. By the time the facial nomonitor fires, you're already done, you're already cut to or at least injured it, if not cut it totally. So then what you're doing is, over here is you're identifying the horizontal semicircular canal, and this area over here I, the, the, is, is referred to as the facial recess area. What is the facial recess? Facial recess is something that we make. It is not there in your anatomy textbook. You go to Grace Anatomy and, and look for facial recess, there is no, nothing in the index that says facial recess. What is the facial recess? It's something that we make. How do we make it? There is, if this, if the facial nerve is running this way, auditory nerve is running this way, and this is the fossa in, in cubis. I call this the 60 degree angle. I call this the 90 degree angle, and I call this the 30 degree angle. So, the quadratory nerve is speaking of like this. I call this the 30 degree angle, I call this the 90 degree angle, and this area over here is called the 60 degree angle. Which is the safest area to tell? 60 degree angle. So, what you're doing is you're taking this triangle, and you're dropping it into the middle. Area. So in other words, if you make this area deeper, it will automatically throw you into the into the middle. Area. Is that clear? Not clear. Not clear. Okay. All right. We'll show it to you in the lab. I think that will make it clear. In other words, what you're going to do is you see this area over here. If if I drill deep over here, what's going to happen? I'm going to injure the facial nerve. I have to, I have to stop at some point. <coughs> the middle ear is in that direction inside. So if I if I drill the 90 degree angle, either I will hit the horizontal semicircular canal or I will hit the facial nerve. If I drill over there, what's going to happen? Either I hit the quadratory nerve or I hit the facial nerve. Safest place to drill is the 60 degree angle which is over here. And so you're taking this, this bone as you're drilling it, you, 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 you start drilling parallel to the incus. If you stay lateral to the incus, you're always going to be lateral to the facial nerve. Well, just like the diagastric muscle in the neck. You stay lateral to the diagastric muscle in the neck, you're lateral to all the important structures. Same principle. So if you stay lateral to the to the to the, the incus you, and you and you drill this area over here, this what I call the 60 degree angle, it will automatically put you in the in the in that direction of the of the facial recess. And there again, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I generally use a two millimeter diameter or one to one and a half millimeter diameter to get it. Okay. Is it clear now? I beg your pardon. You're not measuring anything. It's just when I'm talking to you, you should know what I'm talking about. I'm not measuring any angle. I'm calling it a, a 60 degree angle. I'm calling it a 90 degree angle. Suppose I tell you drill at the 60 degree angle. I'm talking to my resident. You should know what I'm talking about, right? If I talk to you in a language, if I start talking to me in Chinese, you're not going to understand it. Right? So it's, it's a term that I've created. It's not a term that you're going to find in, 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 in any book. So we are giving it a name. Okay. So my name is Arun. So when, when somebody in this room starts shouting Arun, I know who's calling me. So that, that's, that's all we're doing. So don't get confused. Okay. But you understand the principle, what we're trying to do. We're trying to deepen it, make it deeper and deeper and deeper till we... You're trying to take out a cave. You're taking bone out till you hit the, the spot. So this is one of the mistakes in this book. And this is showing you a 90 degree angle here. Actually, the 90 degree angle, it should be more this way. This is one of the, the, the mistakes that we see in this book. Anyways, uh, once, you've, once you've opened up the, the, the facial recess and the epitemporum, we follow that in. Again, this is showing the deepening of the facial recess. The facial recess on the other side is a cave from the middle here. So, so you're going to open it a small hole which is going to throw you in the facial recess, okay? So now, and, and this is the what we were talking about. If you look at the upper, the, this is another thing that we use in our clinic, uh, is if you use the upper border of the incus and you multiply that by two, that's approximately where you're going to find the patient. So you follow this upper border, upper border of the incus over there, and in your, if that distance you take, you multiply that by two, somewhere over there is where the facial nerve is going to be. Okay. There are several ways of finding out the, where, where the facial nerve is. There are some people who will use the digastric ridge. 
and they'll follow the diagnostic ridge and find the facial nerve. Fine. You need to know eight different ways of finding the facial nerve. Why? Because you may not find a specific landmark in a particular case. If there's a tumor, if there's a lot of granulation tissue, you're not able to find that. Then you go to an area which is safer where you can find the nerve and then work from there. So always known to unknown. So you find the second genu of the facial nerve. So the facial recess is a triangular area that is bounded by which structures? Facial nerve posteriorly, the quadratimpany nerve anteriorly, and the incus buttress, or sometimes referred to as the incus bar or incus buttress, to the to superior. Why is it superior? Why is it not the right or left? Because it's going to be different in the right and left bone. So why is it? Why do we call it superior? Because the head, the top of the head, is here. The foot is there. You follow me? Right. So that's the reason why we are saying when we say go superiorly, you expect to go that way. But the patient is turned around. It's in relation to the relationship of the patient's head. So that is the reason why we are talking about those terminologies. And then what we're going to do is open this. Once we open this, what are you going to find? You're going to find a structure over here, which is the long process of the incus and the lenticular process of the incus. Now, there are certain terms that you have to know in anatomy because when, when Dr. Abdul Rahman Hajir is going to talk to you in, this, in surgery and he's going to give you some instructions. If you don't know the, the, what he's talking about, you're saying, what are you saying? I don't know what he's saying. So just remember that the, 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 the malleus has a head, a neck, a lateral process, and a, and, a, and, a, and a handle or a manubrium of the malleus. The incus has a body, a short process, a long process, and a lenticular process. Stapes has a head, a neck, an anterior cruise, posterior cruise, and a foot plate. Clear? You know all this, or, or you want me to go over it? Look. Malleus has a head, a lateral process, a neck. So when 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 the professor tells you cut the neck of the of the malleus, you're not going to cut over here or here. You're going to cut it over there. The incus has a short process, a long process, and a lenticular process. And the stapes has a head, a neck, anterior crus, posterior crus, and a foot. So now what we have done is he's extended the facial recess, he's made it a little deeper and now we are starting to, this is a, fun, a basic operation that you have to know. Why? Because you are, doing, you are going to be doing 400, no, 800 cochlear implants next year. So it's very important for you, you are going to be assisting on those cases. This part of the operation, every, every resident should be able to do by, by himself. So the doctor, so the professor can just come in, put the implant, go to the next patient, put the other implant, 10 ORs running, <laughs> perfect. This is the way to do it. You know why we teach you? We are actually very selfish people. Uh, so, so this is the <laughs> so this is the this is the this is the, the, the you can see again over here the, the incus buttress, the posterior uh, the, the incus. You can see the uh, posterior uh, tendon of the incus. You can see the superior ligament of the malleus and incus. Okay, it's like a fold that's up on the top. You've opened it, and once you've opened it, you can see now the horizontal canal. You can see the fascia. You can see the posterior crus of the stapes, the anterior crus of the stapes, you can see a little bit of the foot plate. And this, there is an eminence over here that is called the pyramidal eminence. And what is there in the pyramidal eminence? The stapedius muscle. And you can see the stapedius tendon that gets variably attached, sometimes most often to the neck of the, of the, of the stapes, sometimes even to the, even to the, even to the crus or to the, or to the head. You come over here, you can see the over, the round, so this is, the stapes is placed in a niche called the oval window niche. The round window, on the other hand, is in the round window niche. The oval window looks lateral. The round window looks backward. Okay. Now, oftentimes in the round window niche, you'll have some mucosal membranes. You have to take those out in order to see it. Vitally important when you're doing a cochlear implant. Some of us will take out a little bit of the bone over here to get into that membrane. Now, why is this anatomy important? Again, you have, you know, God has given us some landmarks. It's very useful for the surgeon. So now you know, you can use the incus to find the facial nerve. You can use the diagnostic bridge to find the facial nerve. 
you can use the quarter tympani nerve and trace the quarter tympani nerve, and that will take you to the facial nerve. You can follow the, the, the tensor tympani tendon, take down the pyramidal ridge. Bad idea. Why is it a bad idea? It's a bad idea because the muscle of the stapedius strep muscle, if this is the facial nerve, the stapedius muscle is doing this. So if you try to find the muscle, you'll probably hit the nerve before you, you find, the, find the, the, the muscle. So that is the reason, but it will give you a, 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 it's a good rough uh, uh, landmark to it. The other thing to remember is remember this relationship, horizontal semicircular canal, facial nerve over window. That relationship should be cemented in your head. From superior to inferior, it's always horizontal canal, facial nerve, and <coughs> There are a few more landmarks to the, the facial nerve that we are going to see. Now what they have done over here is he's taken off some more bone. He's unroofed the epitemporum and take or taken off some more bone. Oftentimes over here you will see there's a, there's a plate of bone that comes down which you sometimes refer to as Sheehy's cob. Jim Sheehy was a surgeon at the, at the house here and he described this structure. It's vitally important to take that structure down because deep to it is a pocket. There's another air cell. It's a little bone. Bony air cell. That is called the supratubal recess, and cholecystomas can hide over there. So you can you can do you can take off all the cholecystoma over here. What is cholecystoma? Skin in the wrong place. You take everything off. It's more than that, but for basic understanding, that's good enough. So you take all of that off, but if you don't open that area, you will get into trouble. Why? Because you could have left something behind and not know that you left. So now you've got, you see this thing over here, this is now you're starting to see the head of the malleus. This joint over here which is called the incudo malleolar joint, superior ligament of the malleus and incus, short process of the incus, long process of the incus, lenticular process of the incus. Why is it called lenticular? Yeah, but why is it called lenticular? Lenticular meaning lens-like, it looks like a lens. It looks like a, like a and, and, and these, are, these are actual joints, they are actually synovial joints. So if for example you denervate this joint by cutting this ligament, you will actually get an, an, a, a fibrosis and an ossification of that joint. So just remember that. So it's vitally important to try to respect these structures as you are doing it. Now what they have done over here now is they have taken out the incus. And the reason why they have taken out the incus is so that you are able to see what is, what is going on behind it. So this is the surface of the joint, the incudomalular joint. Remember there's an incus over there? We have taken it out. Once that incus is out, now you can see the head of the malleus. You can see the joint surface. You're seeing a structure over here. And what, what structure is that? Cochleriform process. Cochleriform process. And, and, and the tendon that comes out of that cochleriform process is what? Tensor tympani tendon. And the nerve supply of the tensor tympani tendon is what? Very good. So fifth nerve. So so, so that is what the, that is what a fifth nerve blood, uh, nerve supply. All right. So you are now you can see the head of the malleus. You can see the, the neck of the malleus. All right. You're seeing this thing over here. You're seeing the quadratinity nerve going over the the, the density tendon. There are some other structures that you are seeing which are vitally important. Just remember that the the anterior genu. You know what is the genu? Genu means in in French. Genu means knee. So the, the, you call it the anterior genu or the first genu. That way, that's because it looks like a knee. It looks like it's got a bend. Right? So, so that is the reason why this area is called the genu of the facial nerve. The genu of the facial nerve is always, always, always cranial and slightly deep to the cochlear form process. Okay? So the genu of the facial this nerve as you follow it in, it's always going to be cranial towards the head end and deep to the tensor tympani tendon and the, and the cochlear form process. Why is that important? You can a lot of structures can get destroyed, but it's very hard to destroy the tendon. And so even when there is invasive pathology such as a cholesterol, the bone gets destroyed, but you can generally see and find the co the, 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 ten, the the tensor tympani tendon. And you can utilize that to find where the genu is and you can find the facial nerve there. Another structure that you see over here is called Jacobson's nerve or 
the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve. Why is that important clinically? It's important clinically because it also will take you, if you follow that nerve, it will take you in the region of the cochleariform process. If it takes you in the region of the cochleariform process, you can utilize that as an indirect landmark to find the facial nerve. So basically, the temporal bone has to be used like a roadmap. You don't grow, you don't go from Abdulaziz Street to Jeddah Street to some other street by jumping. You have to use the road. So you have to know I'm going from this point to this point, I'm going from this point to that point. It has to be in a very systematic fashion. Okay. Now what they've done, they've cut off the head of the malleus and they've ex and they've demonstrated to you the skull. And underneath this skull is there's a very fine paper that was written by John House several years ago on the supratibal recess. Go to the library and take a look at it. There's a recess, there's a little space over there where cholecystomas can hide. So they've cut the superior uh, suspensory ligament of the malleus and in case they've, they've used uh, an instrument called the malleus nipper to nip the head of the, the neck of the malleus. They've left the uh, uh, cochleariform process in the tendon and what they got, what, why, why this is important is when you're decompressing the facial nerve, you can decompress the horizontal and the mastoid seg 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 segments of the facial nerve utilizing this approach. You're also starting to see the undersurface of the drum. The drum, because this the canal wall is still intact, you're starting to see the undersurface of the drum. This is, you know, this, is, this is the canal wall and this is the drum. You're starting to see that surface because the drum is attached to the manubrium. You will see all those structures as you get in. You're also starting to see some cells over here. These are the hypotympanic cells. Why is that important? You sometimes have to cut the quadratympany nerve and extend this down, so-called an extended facial recess approach. Why? Because there are tumors called glomus tumors that can be hiding in that area when you have to, uh, to uh, attack those tumors is over there. All right. Let's now look at facial nerve decompression. We are again going to belabor the same issues. Like I said, if the facial nerve was not there, we would not have jobs. So here it is. You have the, the first genu of the facial nerve, the second genu of the facial nerve, facial nerve coming down, quadratympany nerve going up. This is what I call the 30 degree angle, the 90 degree angle, the 60 degree angle, deepening of it, and on. Okay, after 10 minutes. So as we go over here, again, we are, we've described the, 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 uh, the, the facial nerve in its horizontal components. There is a, a, a term that was used at the House of Institute called barbapole. And a barbapole is a, is a spiral. If you've seen a pole, out, have you seen in, 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 in the US, you have, when you have a barber shop, there is a, a cylinder that rotates, which is roughly spirals on the red and blue. That's, that's exactly what you're doing. So you're sort of barbapoling it till you eggshell thin the bone out and then you pick off that bone uh, in that fashion. So here you go, you're uncovering the sheath. You can use a sickle knife or, or a rosin needle or, or a pick, or you can use a diamond knife in the operating room uh, in order to do it. But you should be able to today at least do this. Uh, is that the plan? Is that the, where is uh, Sally? Uh, is that the plan today is to do how much are, uh, they good, how much are they you're going to be doing today? Facial nerve and then labyrinth tomorrow? All right, so you open the sheath of the facial nerve. Now, there's another structure when you, that you will need to look with at, which is known as the endolymphatic sac. What is the endolymphatic sac? There's a line called Donaldson's line. So what I want you to do is make this, this bone over here very, very thin. There's an area over here which is sometimes referred to as the triangle of Troutman, or it's sometimes referred to as Troutman's triangle. What is the Troutman's triangle? It is bordered by the, the, the superior petrosal sinus superiorly, Inferior petrosal sinus inferiorly, labyrinth medially, and the sigmoid sinus laterally. In the old days, when we did not have good neurosurgeons in India, we used to go through the Stratman's triangle and drain cerebellar abscesses. That was the importance of it. It's also useful to identify a structure called the endolymphatic duct and sac. What you do over there is you, you uh, draw a line through the horizontal canal and take off all this bone, and you will see a whitish structure which is very thick. And that is, it's, it's, the, it's thick because there are two leads of dura, and there's a structure between it called the endolymphatic sac. The endolymphatic sac is not like this pocket. If you look at the histology of the endolymphatic sac, it's a bunch of microtubules. So just remember that on your, for, your, uh, for your board exams. So it looks, this is what it, it sort of looks like. There are some blood vessels on it, so it again tells you what it is. 
and you should be able to uncover the sack. People, used, this is the, the the shunt operation that was done. Ex uh, once again, extended facial recess. You take out the this bone. You cut through the facial nerve, the the cordal tympani nerve, but you keep the facial nerve intact and dissect it down. Now you can see the meat, the the medial surface of the drum, and the the cut end of the nerve. That is sometimes referred to as the extended facial recess. Medial to the facial nerve is a structure called the jugular bulb. If you follow that sigmoid sinus down, it will go medial to the jugular it, The so facial nerve is going to be here, and that, that, that jugular bulb is going to be here. But it's actually a sigmoid sinus is going to go medial to it. So you've got to remember that these structures sort of cross each other. Uh, how much are they going to be dissecting today? Uh, do we know? So I think over here we're going to stop and then we'll talk about uh, if you're going to do the labyrinth because I think they're calling me to, to go and we'll, I'll turn over the microphone to uh, Professor Wahaba to uh, take over from here. And then uh, we'll talk about labyrinth later when we get time, maybe even in the evening. I don't mind waiting afterwards. I have nothing, nowhere to go at other than the hotel. So we'll be happy to talk about opening the labyrinth later. Okay. Best way to get advantage of this course is you have to read up before. And then you come back, and then you go back and again consolidate your 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 anatomy. There's a beautiful chapter in the Shambo's book of, of, of anatomy. You have the old Shambo, it's, it's, it's not very good in the new one, but the old one has a nice chapter. Which book is this uh, picture was taken? Oh, this is all from Ralph Nelson's Atlas. And you're welcome to take all these pictures. You can take, make a copy of it. I've already asked uh, Ralph if it's okay to give, and he doesn't mind. So, so if you want, you can just, just get your pin drives and take, take whatever you want. Oh, yes, 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 of course. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes, yes. yes, yes. yes, yes. Just a reflection.